Hi, my name is Diane Weinberg. My practice, Weinberg Elder Law, is based in Georgia and focuses on all things guardianship and conservatorship. Today I want to talk to you about something that people talk about a lot, you'll see it on TV, but people really don't understand, sometimes even attorneys don't understand what it is, and that's the attorney-client privilege and when we need to protect the privilege and when it's necessary sometimes to break the privilege to protect the client. Now, I know sometimes people find this difficult to believe, but attorneys actually are governed by ethical and professional rules. I know, shocking, right? Georgia, it's called the rules of professional conduct. And breaking these rules have consequences. We can have a mark on our record. We can even get disbarred depending on the seriousness of the violation. Now, there are different types of privileges. Attorney client, there's something called a work product privilege. Sometimes you have a your doctor patient privilege, a psychiatric privilege, but all of those privileges are interpreted very narrowly. So that in this case, the attorney client privilege, the privilege is restricted to communication that the attorney has with the client. That's it. It's not, doesn't extend to anything else. So if the third person's involved, sometimes I have one re conversation recently where the potential client wanted to bring in this third party that was completely unrelated. Well, nothing in our conversation was privileged because we had that third party there. Um, it can also be broken if the client goes and tells somebody else, hey, great aunt Edna, guess what I talked about with my attorney? The privilege no longer exists there. Now, there are times when we have to break the privilege, or we are, don't say we have to, we are authorized to, we have the ability to break the privilege, particularly when we're dealing with an individual with a disability. Now, if that person's my client, I'm supposed to maintain as normal an attorney-client relationship as possible. But sometimes I may need to break the privilege to bring a family member into the conversation because I'm struggling to communicate with that individual. Um, sometimes I have to look to documents like powers of attorney. Um, by the way, if I'm dealing with an agent under the power of attorney, then actually the privilege is still, um, is still intact because that agent would then stand in the place of my client. So it would still be intact, but anything that I, but just be aware that would be a limited situation where we might still have the attorney client privilege. Maybe I, I'm fearful for my client's well-being, so I'm going to bring in a adult protective services, care manager, police, or another protective agency. If there's another litigation, maybe the party uh, that I'm um, uh, opposed to, the uh, opposing party, um, doesn't understand what's going on. In that case, I may request the court appoint a guardian ad litem to, who is a person who would represent that individual's interest. You'll see that a lot in divorce proceedings. And if I'm very concerned about that individual, my client's uh, situation, then I may even petition the court to be to to appoint somebody, not me, appoint somebody else as the guardian or conservator for my client. By the way, at that point, I would no longer be able to represent that client because I've been adverse to them as part of the protective proceeding. Um, disclosing the client's confidence or a client's condition. I'm not supposed to tell somebody, hey, I think my client has this disability, but sometimes I have to, if, even if the client says, don't tell anyone. Um, let me give you an example for that. I had a client who was getting in trouble with the court and the court was threatening to put her in jail. We were having a conference outside of my client's presence and the court said, I need you, Ms. Weinberg, to tell the client if she doesn't shape up, I'm putting her in jail. And I said, Your Honor, I'm happy to do that, but understand my client suffers with a disability and she's not going to understand. And with that conversation, we were able, I think, to keep my client out of jail. Um, disclosure should be limited to the extent necessary to protect the client. So I didn't go into great detail about what her disability was. I simply let the court know in this case what that she was suffering under a disability. Um, now, if somebody dies, the attorney-client privilege, by the way, extends beyond their death. So the privilege will continue with me, really, until I pass. Um, and that's very important for people to understand. Um, I want to address one final issue, and that's bad references on the internet. That's become a real issue with attorneys today. And if the client breaks the privilege and says bad things about me on the internet, the attorney says, well, can I respond? Increasingly, the bar associations are saying yes. Actually, attorneys, if they break the privilege, you have the right to respond. So just be aware of that. 
And again, my name is Diane Weinberg. I'm with Weinberg Elder Law. If you have any questions about this video, please feel free to contact our office. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Take care.